um, haven't been able to, to come on in person. So if you're, you know, if you're happy about that, that's grand. But if you'd rather turn your camera off, that's fine. We don't mind that at all. Um, I'm joined this morning with some colleagues from Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. I have got Samantha Hyde um, Rihanna Mallon, who are helping me today with breakout rooms and Aoife Dual as well. So um, Aoife's on my team. My name is Jilly Dugan. I head up biodiversity recovery at Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and I'm delighted to be involved in this radius project. Um, also today, of course, we have Melanie with us. Melanie is the Senior Communities Officer at Radius Housing. So do you want to just say hi, Melanie, everybody? Yes, I'm just seeing uh, are a couple of people still having difficulty coming in, Linda and Lucy. Lucy and Linda, can you hear us? I'm just seeing a wee audio thing coming up on mine. Because I know that some people are having problems with Zoom. Does anybody else have problems with getting in Zoom-wise? Is everyone... No, everyone's, everyone's okay? I think Lucy's, I think, you okay now, Lucy? Okay, no, I'm just aware of time. I'm only just popping in to say hello and um, just say, you know, welcome to, to the training. Um, most of you'll know me, but I don't, but I don't know any, um, everybody. Um, and, and it's great that you've taken the time out to, to, to do the project. And um, just in terms of collecting your kits, um, I know a lot of you have collected your kits. They're at reception in Hollywood to collect them now. And um, for those people who were late to to maybe submit their application, if we've any extra kits, because um, games can get up to three kits. If we've any extra kits, we'll absolutely allocate those. And um, but I've most of them allocated at at the moment. And um, this is primarily a an environmental project, but look what um, we really want to get in terms of the outcomes are good relations. And um, a lot of this project is being funded through our shared housing. Um, money and really underpinning that is bringing people together and developing relations. What we're going to do as part of the project is after Easter, what we're going to be doing is encouraging um, plant swaps within um, our schemes and our groups and um, our community empowerment officers are going to be taking this forward and what I'm also going to be asking for is if any of our um, groups or schemes would like to, vol to volunteer to be actively involved with that, I would love to hear back from you. I will be sending out emails about this after Easter, but I hope it's something that you'll get really actively involved with. It'll allow you to, to, to visit each other's schemes or, or groups, see, see what other people are doing, what ideas they have, and hopefully plant um, swap, swap plants. Um, so I'll be in contact with you all in due course. That's Thank great. You. Thank you. Um, brilliant idea, the plant swap thing. So you may all get um, sowing your seeds. And stuff. So yes, my, my name is Jilly Duggan. Um, I've got a presentation to give to you this morning. What we're going to do is um, we're going to run through half the slides and um, then we're going to go into breakout rooms, which I'll set up for you. You have nothing to do um, to chat through a few things for about 10 minutes. And um, then we're gonna have a comfort break. So that's gonna be at about uh, 10 past 11, I think. So you can have a wee cup of tea or a pee or whatever you need. Um, and then we can carry on with the second half. So um, without further ado, I am going to share my presentation with you. Okay, so can everybody see that okay? Thumbs up. Yeah, brilliant. That's lovely. Yeah, so this morning, this morning's session is about growing in small spaces. So not everybody has acres of ground or a big garden or whatever. Um, and indeed, many people wouldn't want that because it takes an awful lot of work. But I think all of us have some space inside or outside where we can grow something for ourselves and today the aims are to really understand the benefit of growing plants in small spaces in whatever space you have to identify what materials you might need and what you can upcycle um, and get for free which is always good develop the knowledge of what to plant and when to plant it um, and enjoy the fruit and veg of your labor afterwards so um benefits of growing plants. Um, whoops, excuse me. Um, 
Obviously, physical health. Um, so getting outside, even doing a wee bit of gardening, pottering around the garden is really good exercise. Um, and if you start growing a few herbs and maybe some salad leaves and stuff, healthy food habits um, do come do come from there. And we see that all the time, actually, especially with children and grandchildren. So if you grow a few wee bits, um, even baby carrots, some salad leaves, some pea shoots, which we'll talk about later on. If kids can pick those and eat them, they're more inclined to eat um, lots of other different things and different grains. And mental health, of course. So being around um, plants has been proven to um, improve your mood and your well-being. And of course, as humans, we have evolved along with plants. So it is possible that they release um, bioactive molecules or um, that make us feel good. So taking care of plants um, can also give you a routine, a routine and something to focus on. Um, of course, for biodiversity, and that means for nature, gardens and small urban spaces um, are really, really important, no matter how small they are, and they can have a really positive impact on biodiversity and provide food and shelter for a range of wildlife, um, including pollinating insects and birds. And then, of course, for the climate, and I'm sure anybody who watches the news these days, but and it all seems to be very grim, but I suppose we're all aware of global warming and plants can help to store carbon as well as improve um, the resilience of our ecosystem um, and connectivity, which is essential really to um, mitigating the, the negative effects of climate change. So where to grow? Um, window boxes. Um, and I know, I think as part of your kit, you, you would have gotten window boxes. They're a great use of space um, and you can put those indoors or outdoors. So place them, um, for example, somewhere that gets some light, which could be your kitchen window, um, so that you can see them on a daily basis. So actually, it's no point in having a window box and then putting it somewhere where you can't see it, because that kind of defeats the purpose a little bit. Um, I'd also say that um, obviously if you're putting window boxes outside on your kitchen window or somewhere else, um, only do that at ground floor level, obviously, because if you're up two or three stories um, and a window box falls down on top of some, somebody, that wouldn't be a good thing at all. Um, and you can always, another thing, um, and Aoife would do um, advocate this very much, is to ask at your local recycling centre or council if they've any spare window boxes, if you fancy another one, because they often do, or they have extras, which they give away for free. So, um, and then I suppose where to grow and what to grow in, um, pots, pots are really, great way to bring a bit of greenery into your house or garden, um, especially if you don't have any green space outside. And all sorts of plants will happily grow in pots from herbs to trees. So if you look at the photograph on the right is that's a wee citrus tree. Um, so things like orange trees and lemon trees, which actually have a lovely scent as well, grow very well inside in our houses. Um, and things, okay, um, the left hand side there you can see some lavender so things like herbs grow really well in pots too and I suppose the thing about um, pots is they don't they don't have to be bought pots and um, you can recycle lots of different things and we'll talk about that um, in just a wee minute so again check with your local recycling centre who might have free pots um, I suppose because gardeners give them away all the time um, and good tip that I would give you is the larger the pot the easier it is to look after whatever's growing in it certainly in terms of watering because when you have a very tiny pot and um, it can dry out very very quickly especially in the summertime um, and then I suppose we always um, we don't always think in three dimensions you know we think about the space we have outside but actually most of us have some vertical space as well. Um, and and the, this is perfect for a range of climbing plants um, and can liven up your, you know, if you've got concrete or brick walls or whatever. So um, 
obviously, um, you know, before you start attaching anything to a wall, you would need to ask permission for that. But um, but there's lots of things you can do. You know, there's like an old ladder there with like pots going up and in, in different tiers. Um, you can use pallets to make planters. Um, uh, trellis. Again, you could, you could probably, you know, you don't have to attach that physically to a wall if you've got a fence or something. Um, you know, you could just tie it on the string. Um, also think about arches and stuff. And then um, guttering, old guttering or um, and plastic bottles. You can see the middle picture there has some nicely painted plastic bottles with the middle cut out of them can be attached to pallet planters. Um, and think about things like peas and beans and sweet peas, which um, I'm sure lots of people remember from, from years ago and they smell wonderful. They'll happily grow in pots and climb up bamboo canes if you just make a wee framework for those. So upcycling containers. Um, I always say that you can grow in almost anything that can hold soil. Um, the only thing you need to remember is that whatever you attempt to grow in needs to have drainage holes in the bottom because um, if you if you don't have drainage holes in the bottom and you over water or, or it's outside and you get lots and lots of rain and the water can't drain away and you can drown the roots of your plants. So whatever you use, just make sure to punch a few drainage holes in the bottom of those as well. And I know it's unfortunate, but an awful lot of things that we buy these days, like mushrooms or fruit or, you know, grapes, do seem to come in um, plastic tubs and packaging. And so before you put them into recycling, they can have another life um, and be used quite a few times, actually, to start off your seedlings or to grow salad leaves or things like pea shoots. And also get creative. So it's, you know, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be a square thing or a round thing. Um, an old pair of boots, um, an old pair of welly boots actually is a good thing to grow into. Uh, a rusty watering can and even old paint cans can get a new lease of life as planters. Um, I would say with the paint cans to make sure obviously that they're, they're empty and they've been really well cleaned out. Um, and again, things, simple things like eggshells. So, you know, you have your boiled egg in the morning, you take your top off, you've eaten um, the egg out of the middle of it. Uh, this is a lovely thing to do with kids in particular. So you can um, just put a wee bit of compost on those. Some cress seeds, cover those over, water them. Um, and the lovely thing about eggshells is that you can draw with a felt tip um, very gently, like wee faces and stuff on those. And kids just absolutely love them. And of course, you can cut and eat the cress afterwards. Um, things like egg cartons and toilet paper rolls, you know, the inside of the toilet roll can all be used to germinate seedlings. Um, and once the seedlings have a few leaves at the top, you can transplant those out into a bigger container. So let's talk a wee bit about um, compost. What type of compost? Well, if you're buying compost, um, go for an all-purpose compost, multi-purpose compost, um, or, or a vegetable compost, it might be described as. But please, please always make sure to try and buy peat-free compost. So um, because the peat and compost comes from peatlands, and these habitats are very important for a range of rare wildlife um, and plants that are threatened both um, globally and locally. And so they peatlands have developed over hundreds of thousands of years at a rate of like one millimeter per year. Um, so they, they have been developed really, really slowly and they're a very valuable carbon sink and so are really important in the fight against climate change. So I know everybody talks about, you know, planting trees and planting woodlands, but actually peatlands are every bit as good, if not better, at holding on to carbon than woodland. So, um, so when you're buying compost, please check the labels to make sure they are peat free. Um, and actually, uh, 
great thing I discovered last year, and I just checked it the other day, is that B&Q, for instance, their own label compost is, you know, the ones you get in the purple bags and stuff, is peat free, completely peat free. So, um, and you have to look at the back, actually, to see that, but um, I think that's really, really encouraging. So here we have a lovely picture of Ballynahone Bog in Mahara, which is a recovering peatland. Um, and with our help, peatlands in Ireland can, of course, recover. Um, Ballynahone Bog is the only one that is currently growing in Northern Ireland. So, and that's thanks to dams that have been placed um, within the peatlands to help retain water. Um, and therefore that helps retain carbon as well. So we talked a wee bit about compost, but um, a hobby horse of mine and something I'm really passionate about is making your own compost. Um, and why would you bother? Well, I suppose um, it's free, so you can save yourself money and um, it uses up waste products um, that would otherwise go to landfill. Um, compost, homemade compost feeds all sorts of organisms, which means you've got healthy soil. Um, and if you've got healthy soil, you've got healthy plants. So feeding the soil is the foundation of organic gardening. Um, and I, um, I know that you know, people are a wee bit scared about making compost, and um, but it's a natural process and it will transform your kitchen and garden waste into a really valuable and nutrient-rich food for your plants. So if you have a small growing space outdoors, um, you might have room to put a compost bin. And um, Compost bins come in all shapes and sizes now. You could even make your own out of sort of like a, a plastic bucket. If you have it placed outside, um, you might want to you know put some drainage holes in it and a wee tray underneath um but uh, but if not you know find out if one of your neighbors or somebody in your local community or a local community group is making their own compost and they might be really happy that you add your kitchen waste along with theirs um and there's no magic art to making compost basically it's learn up material over time um, and that material would be um, kitchen scraps and garden waste and you want to turn it regularly to let the air in and let the, the microbes get working and um, have patience and let nature do the rest. So patience is a thing that, that isn't in abundance a lot of the time and compost kind of teaches you how to do that. Um, so basically you can make a pile of compost material in an unused area of your garden if you have a garden or you can make a surround out of recycled pallets or you can use one of the, the, the large plastic compost bins um, and how long will it take I suppose that's um, that's a question we get asked a lot so it depends it depends on quite a few things, but it can take, say, about six months to a year to make good um, friable compost. So that's like nice loose compost. Um, and that will, the time will depend on how often it's turned, um, what time of year. So obviously in the summertime, it's warmer, microbes get to, um, they're more active. Um, worms, whether or not you've got composting worms or not, um, the mixture of material that you have. So um, you, you, want to, you want to have a mixture of like, like dry material and wet material. So like kitchen palings and apple cores, even things like grass clippings. But then they can break down very quickly. They produce lots of nitrogen. So you want to mix that with um, like brown materials, like scrunched up paper, maybe some cardboard um, things like tea bags, coffee grounds, you know, if you had a um, hamster or rabbit or some of, the, some of the children had those, you can add those, um, you can add the bedding to your compost as well. So, and also moisture content. So if, if it's not wet enough, your compost can take um, quite a while to break down. And if it's too wet, that's also not a good thing either so um 
So as I said, good things to compost include veg peelings, um, tea bags, plant prunings and grass cuttings. Um, and these are these are fast um, to break down. So you want things that are what we call brown material that are slower to rot down um, but provide vital fibre and carbon and structure to your compost. So things like crushed eggshells um, can be included and empty cardboard um, egg boxes inside the toilet rolls um, and leaves. Obviously leaves in the, in the autumn time are a really good thing to add to that too. And then, um, but the things to absolutely not add are meat and dairy products and um, diseased plants definitely not dog poo um, or cat litter or nappies um, or anything like that now i know we all we're kind of all used to now which is brilliant having like a food bin or a garden bin where i live it's a brown bin i know other people have green bins but um and that's where you would put your food waste in so and actually you you know, you can put any kind of food waste in there at all because that all gets taken away by the council and is composted in an industrial way um, so that it's there's big volume. It's turned um, really, really frequently. That creates a lot of heat and everything breaks down really, really quickly. So in a commercial sense, they can do that. Um, and the heat will, I suppose, in effect, almost pasteurize um whatever's in your food bin but obviously but if you're doing that at home and um, please do remember no meat or dairy products or um anything like that so and then worms worms are no worms well worms are nature's engineers they're absolutely brilliant and they will help to speed up the composting process for you um and the thing I find about composting worms is they appear as if by magic out of nowhere. Um, I even see, you know, if you leave a bag of compost or um, something sitting for maybe a week or so and you go to pick it up, there's invariably some composting worms underneath. And composting worms are, you can see them in the picture there, they're sort of quite orangey red colour. Um, don't grow huge like you would have your earthworms and stuff but um they really are absolutely brilliant and as I say if you set up a composter they do usually appear as if by magic and um, the only time when they don't really appear is if you use a sealed compost bin so you can get compost bins that are open to the ground underneath and if you have some soil to set those on that's a really good thing um, but if they're enclosed at the bottom, you, you might not get naturally occurring composting worms. But actually, there are some organisations that will send them to you. Um, and we, AFA has kindly put um, a few places here. It's the Urban Worm. They have, actually, they have a brilliant website, so which it shows you how you could make a wee wormery, actually, out of stuff at home that's just um, recycled, but they do have worms available to send straight to your door and all you need to do is make a home to welcome them. So the worm starter kit has bedding, um, which can be made from compost or dump shredded paper, etc. cetera. Um, the thing about composting and worms is they don't really like citrus, so lemon and orange peel and stuff like that, and um, not too many onions or coffee as they're very acidic. Um, and they also don't like oily foods or oil um, because they breathe through their skin and obviously that would stop them from doing that. But um, but there's lots of stuff available on the internet about how to set, um, set up your own worm farm. And actually, do you know, some of the workshops we were doing in the autumn in, in some schools where we had set up orchards in the autumn, we talked about composting and we bought we brought a bucket of composting worms with us and, and the kids just loved them and they were fascinated by them. And of course, if you know somebody else who makes compost, you can ask them for a handful of their own worms because there's usually no shortage of those at all. So there you go, a lot of, a lot of information there. Um, 
But I think it's time that you had a wee chat between yourselves. And we're going to um, break out. Well, I'm going to set up breakout rooms now. So you'll automatically be sent. Hey, hopefully you found, you found enough to interest you in the first half. Um, so what to grow? Obviously, you have had um, you've had a kit, which sounds brilliant. Um, and with your wee bug hotel and everything. And we'll discuss more of that um next week when we do do the one on biodiversity and we're decided because i think i caught the end of a conversation there where you know people were saying it looks lovely and where's the best place to put it so we can talk about that um next week so what to grow there's there are many options um for growing and um, depending on what you want so for instance you can grow flowers for um attracting pollinators so that's like you know, bumblebees and solitary bees um, and other pollinating insects and things like butterflies and stuff to um, encourage biodiversity. You could grow herbs, um, which are really good for insects too, but also for you, for the smell and for your cookery and stuff. Um, you could grow vegetables and salad crops. And actually you don't need a lot of room to start doing that. Um, and also fruit. You can, um, sorry, I'm just going to let somebody in there. Louise, um, you can grow, there are things you can grow um, brilliantly in hanging baskets like um, like strawberries or that wee picture is actually of alpine strawberries, you know, the wee wild strawberries, um, which grow really well and spread all over the place. Um, so even if you have a small space, don't be, um, you know, Okay, you might want to grow loads of cabbages and spuds and things, but don't be put off because there's so many things you can grow. So flowers for pollinators. Um, if you have, so flowers normally fall into two categories broadly. So you have um, annual flowers. So if, um, we bit of noise in the background there. So if you're, if, if you think that might be you, if you just put yourself on mute, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so annual flowers. Annual flowers, well, you can sow the seeds. Um, the flowers grow quite quickly. They flower and they die. So they complete their life cycle in one year. And then there's perennials, which are kind of like permanent plants that... Um, so basically you can grow those from seed or buy a small plant, for instance, in your garden center. Um, and all things being well, it'll be there forever for you. Um, just needs to be trimmed probably every year. So annuals for window boxes, things like um, alyssum and frost flower, cosmos. And cosmos are those, cosmos are lovely flower actually. I, I really, really love them. They're like, if children draw flowers, it kind of looks like a cosmos because it's got those big coloured pe um, petals that can be dark pink or light pink or white or whatever, and a yellow centre. Um, really good for, for insects and stuff. Um, heliotrope, um, such as dwarf marine, and you've got scented stock. And poached eggplant, which is a kind of it looks how it sounds. So it's got like a white outside and a um, yellow in the middle. And actually, if you grow some of that, you'd be blown away by the amount of bees that that can um, attract for you. And then perennials for window boxes, you've got um, obretta and wallflowers, um, bellflower, trailing verbena. And obviously, there's a whole variety of herbs that can be included in those as well. So um, so there's a wee list of positive plants for pollinators. Um, and I know on the first column there will say will show you bedding plants to avoid. So I know the go-to for, for councils, for people, for um in lots of garden centers and stuff is things like geraniums, petunias, and begonias, busy lizzies, um, those double flowered French you know, on African marigolds and stuff. And actually those aren't um, really any good at all for pollinating insects. And that's because they can't, um, they don't really get any food off them. So I think um, like traditionally, because these plants were, you know, they're quite cheap and they're, um, they're kind of bomb proof too, you know, they do, they are quite robust. But 
if you could avoid those and plant something else instead, it's going to be wants to know much better. What seeds we're getting? Oh, what seeds you're getting? So, yes, please. Yes, um, Jill, thank you. In your kit, you're getting um, a pack of wildflower seeds. You are getting some parsley seeds, um, basil seeds. You also pea seeds. So pea seeds for pea shoots. So we'll, yeah, we'll, talk, about we'll talk about that in a wee minute. Uh, and sunflower seeds as well. And I think there's one other that I just can't remember at the minute. But actually the wildflower seeds that you're going to get with your kit um, will also be great for pollinating insects. And you could, you know, you can take small amounts of those and um, sprinkle those and grow them in pots as well. Um, but they're vegetables mostly. Which, which would be brilliant. Um, so things that are good for pollinators um, in terms of annuals um, are things like nasturtiums. Um, nasturtiums are brilliant because they grow um, really, really quickly. Pollinators love them. But also you can eat the flowers and the leaves and the seeds when they appear as well. We grow a lot of nasturtiums here at home. Uh, things like calendula, which is also an edible flower. Um, it's also called pot marigold. So, you know, it looks, and actually it smells terrific, um, whereas the French marigolds really don't. So that grows really easily from seed. That's something to look out for. Things like cornflower, uh, wallflowers, tagetes, borage, cosmos we've mentioned, uh, scabies, rebecca, um, bidens and bacopa. And then um, perennials, which are really good for pollinators, are things like lavender and echinacea, foxgloves that we talked about in people's memories there, um, aquilegia. Uh, also called Granny's Bonnets, I think. Lovely wee flower. Um, Helibores, Erigerum, Eryngium, Astrantia, Alliums, any of the Allium family, you know, those big sort of glo globe heads on them are brilliant. Salvias, uh, Verbena, Catmint, Red and White Clover, also in the springtime, sort of now, and um, things like Crocus and Mascari are much more useful than um, daffodils. Now daffodils are cheery and they're yellow and they make us feel good but actually in terms of food for pollinators um, crocuses and snowdrops are much more beneficial. And then of course um, the perennial herbs which you can eat as well but when they flower they're brilliant for um, our insects. Uh, things like chives, um, garlic chives, rosemary and my rosemary is kind of flowering at the minute, beautiful wee blue flowers, which is great for um, for the bees around here. You've got thyme, herb fennel is a brilliant thing because you can eat the leaves, the fronds, um, the flowers, the young seeds and the mature seeds. So lots of bang for your buck there. Sage, um, stuff like sweet sicily, um, lemon balm and mint, which we've discussed. Um, so there might be quite a few things that you don't recognise here. So, you know, ask at your local garden centre or, or look at the seed packets. Um, and now a lot of seed packets will say good for pollinators or good for bees. Um, and if you are really stuck or you have a chance to go to a garden centre, just stand for 10 minutes and look around and see which plants the bees are going to. And that will give you a really good idea. So uh, plant your sunflowers. Um, sunflower seeds are a really good thing to start with because they're quite a big seed. So all you have to do is fill your container um, sort of with peat free compost, about two thirds full, and then poke a hole in the middle of the compost and drop the seed into it. Now, if you want to, um, you might want to start your sunflowers off inside. So you could, remember we discussed, you can use recycled, you know, packaging like punnets, you would get mushrooms or whatever in. Just make sure there's drainage holes in the bottom and you could sow a few sunflower seeds in there. And then when they come up and germinate, you know, you can gently take those out and pop them on into another pot. Um, so once you've dropped your seed in, um, cover those up with compost not too deep. You kind of, the general rule of thumb is plant the seed to the depth of itself. So 
um, you know, if you've got tiny wee seed, it just needs a very tiny dusting of compost over the top. And if you've got a bigger seed, something like a sunflower seed, um, it needs a bit more compost. Uh, water those in and you should see your sun, sunflowers appearing through within one to two weeks. Um, and that's really good this time of year. You know, we had a really hard frost the other morning. We're still going to get frost, I think, March, even through to April. So it's really good idea to start things indoors at the minute, or if you're doing it outdoors somewhere quite sheltered, that um, might get the, the frost. So, um, and yes, warning, it can get very competitive. So I don't, I know from last year that there were sunflower seeds too, um, and people had great fun and great crack posting their photographs about you know, this is my sunflower, and look at the size of it. Um, and their, their children or grandchildren got involved. And um, oh, it was just great. It was just really, really good. And um, obviously sunflowers are a lovely thing to look at. Um, but also the seeds that are produced are a really good food source for um, all sorts of birds as well. And then herbs. So within, within your kit, you will, as I say, you will have got parsley and basil. Um, we've talked about mint there and um, margarine or oregano is another quite easy herb to grow, um, which is a perennial herb. Other herbs that are good for pots are things like borage, chives, really good uh, lavender because you get that, that smell and the colour and it's gorgeous, rosemary, sage and thyme as well. Um, and I wanted to, just talking about herbs, um, I wanted to share a wee trick I picked up um, a wee while ago, which is, you know, the way you go to the supermarket and you see a pot of herbs and, uh, you know, it's really lush and it's really leafy and it looks really healthy and you bring it home and you, you put it on your windowsill in the kitchen and you treat it with lots of loving care and it doesn't matter what you do, it just dies on you. Um, I'm sure that's happened to lots of people. Well, it's not your fault. You're not a bad gardener. It's because when supermarkets are producing herbs like that, um, because they want people to buy them, you know, they want them to look lush and abundant, they sow far too many seeds in one wee tiny pot. And that means by the time you get those, um, the plant has kind of used all of the nutrition that was available in the compost in that pot. So you can see here, top photograph, that it's a mass, that's a coriander plant on the left, it's just a big mass of roots. So is the chive one in the middle and the par parsley plant to the right hand side. It's just a mass of roots and the roots will come out the bottom of the pot. And that's how you know the need more room. Now, there's a couple of things you can do. You can either take that whole plant and pot it into a bigger pot with some extra compost, or you can do what I've done here in the photographs, which is divide them. So all you need again is on the left, you'll see I, there's like a custard pot there and some yogurt pots. I just put holes in the bottom of those, a wee bag of pig free compost, and I divided the parsley plants in two the coriander plants in two and that's just literally all you have to do is kind of pull them apart quite gently um, with your fingers um, and the chive plant there were so many chives in that one way pot I actually divided those into five so and all you need to do is um, put them into other pots and containers fill that up with your peat free compost and there you have what have I got out of the three plants that I bought? And I bought those herbs in ladle and they're Irish grown and they come in, you know, non-plastic packaging, compostable packaging. They're like £1.24 each. I don't work for ladle. I'm just saying that's what I bought. Um, so out of those three plants that cost about £3.60, I actually ended up with nine herb plants there, um, which I'll be able to, to, to cut the news over a longer period of time. So, um, and then harvesting. The other thing is, you know, sometimes it's hard to know what's the best way to pick them for, you know, to keep the plant healthy. So 
On the left hand side, we've got our parsley plants there. Parsley and coriander, quite similar. I would cut those up maybe about an inch um, above a leaf. So you want to have sort of new leaves that are appearing from the bottom um, so that they can generate new growth. The chives, I always cut right down at the bottom so they're going to grow up cleanly for you. Um, and all those herbs need is a wee rinse in cool water and just shake them dry or pat them, pat them dry and they're ready for you to use. And then what else can you grow? Um, so there are lots of things that are um, that are really fast actually and will help you gain your confidence. So I think the trick is to start small and build on your success. Um, so there are many things you can grow for a quick result. So think about things like salad leaves, um, especially things called oriental leaves, which will mature kind of in, in four to eight weeks and they're really easy to grow from seed. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a ma I can't remember the figure at the minute, but there are millions of packets of salad leaves thrown out in um, the UK every week. Every week, not every year, but every week. It's one of the most binned products that there are. And that, you know, I can kind of understand that because, you know, they're, they're grown quite intensively and really quickly. Um, they're quite fragile. They're usually washed. Um, they put in packets, you know, those packets go through, you know, they go in lorries, they're getting in the supermarket, then people are picking them up and stuff. So actually, by the time you get them, they're not that terrible fresh. Um, they've had a bit of a rough ride and stuff. And you know, you open a pack of salad leaves and you go back two days later, they're in the fridge and they're just a big slimy mess. When actually it's really, really easy to grow some salad leaves yourself. Um, other things that are really good to grow are things like radish and rocket. Um, rocket um, kind of lives up to his name and can be ready to, to pick or cut in sort of five or six weeks time. Things like spinach, even for baby spinach leaves. Spring onions, um, really fast thing to grow too. Pea shoots, which we're going to go into more detail with, and things like microcress. Um, and of course, there's things you can grow that, you know, you can pick as baby vegetables. So I think everybody who grows a carrot thinks the carrot has to be like a foot long. But you know what? It doesn't. So baby carrots um, are absolutely delicious and you don't need a big depth of compost or soil for them and they're ready quite quickly. And actually you can eat um, the carrot tops as well. So think about baby vegetables, like baby turnips, baby carrots, and baby beetroot. Um, yeah, salad leaves. Um, and really very simple. It's like, some, you know, it's like growing or sowing. Anything else, you just fill your container. And you probably need a container for salad leaves that's about, I would say about maybe 20 centimeters, sort of eight inches high. Um, so fill the, compost, the container with compost up to about two or three centimeters from the top and sprinkle your seeds over lightly, like you know, like you were seasoning your food with salt, for instance, salt or pepper. Um, uh, cover those over, not too deeply, um, with some fresh compost, water them in, um, with a, like a fine spray over the top and then leave those to one side um, and they should germinate in probably the space of about a week's time and then they'll grow um, for you quite quickly. So, and if you can get things called cut and come again salad leaves, it means you can pick off whatever leaves you want, like two or three handfuls um, from the outside but most of the energy is still kept in the salad cup and you can actually be taking leaves over a very long period of time for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and it's a good idea to maybe every two weeks, maybe sow a fresh wee batch so you have those coming along as well. Uh, strawberries, we talked about strawberries. Uh, strawberries you can grow in, in a grow bag or a hanging basket. You could out, I also put those in your um, um, the container that you get for you know for your windowsill and stuff. Um, and all you have to do is add plenty of garden compost or, or good rich compost. Um, 
and make sure to water them in hot weather. But there's nothing nicer. It's a bit like tomatoes. We were talking about that earlier. Um, something that's freshly grown like that, that's warmed by the sun and hasn't travelled anywhere. It just really is a lovely thing. Um, so, and strawberry plants will produce strawberries for you for sort of three to four years. And then they do get a bit tired. So it's it might be a good idea to, um, to replace them after that time. Spring onions, um, we talked about spring onions growing really, really quickly, but do you know what? Um, you don't even need seeds of spring onions. So, you know, if you, you buy spring onions, maybe in the shop or the corner shop, and they come with, like you can see in the photographs there, with a bit of a root system. It doesn't even have to be that long. Um, so you can, uh, so cut those spring onions or scallions up probably about an inch. And um, so in a wee bit into the green, use the top of the scallion like you would do anyway. And then um, you can set the bottoms in water, nice clean water, which, and every few days kind of change the water, you know, throw out the old stuff, put some new stuff in. And they will produce new scallions just from that water. Or you can take those, um, those wee bottoms in the root system and pop them into compost as well, and they will grow again for you. Cut them and they'll grow again for you. So it's kind of, um, it's getting stuff for free. So you're getting two pounds for your buck there, which is absolutely brilliant. All you need to do is put those in a wee sunny position. So I think we're going to um, go in the breakout rooms again. I think just, we'll do this one quickly, because I think I'm running away a bit behind. Um, for wait, wait a sec. Whoops, I'm going to stop share. Um, just for five minutes, really. And I'd like you to talk about, um, you know, we've talked about growing some food and some herbs and pea shoot and salad leaves and stuff. Just what you think you might be able to grow or, or what you would make with what you have grown. Um, you know, have you got good recipes? Is you know, what's your favorite thing to eat? So we're going to we'll limit this to five minutes, I think, and then hopefully we'll have uh, room for questions. So see you back in five minutes.
being recorded. Hello, welcome back, everybody. Does anybody want to kick off and share any ideas or tips or recipes that anybody has? Do you want me to start again? Yes, yes, Rebecca, please. Um, one of the ladies, she um, grew parsley and then uses it in her stuffing. Mm. Oh, brilliant. Lovely. Yeah, and yeah. she actually um, browns her mince and puts her stuffing on top sometimes for for dinner. Ah, lovely. Yeah, and Irina, she doesn't have much of a garden, so she used um, a kids paddling pool, you know, like the wee blue hard shell, we like put water on one side and sand on the other. Well, Irina, she she took the approach of filling it with um, flowers and stuff for her front garden. Oh, that's brilliant. Well yeah. done. Lettuce, tomatoes, licks for soup for lunch club here. And I know I have, we have rhubarb, so I've done some rhubarb crumbles and stewed rhubarb and stuff. So, um, yeah. That's brilliant. Great. Thank you. Thank you. What about anybody else? How'd their room go? Barbara had really great stuff about leeks and romaine lettuce. Do you want to share it, Barbara? Um, I, I, you know what you did with a spring onion? Mm -hmm. That's what I do with, with leeks. Now, not in the winter, because you can't get out the back, but um, in, um, in the summer, I always cut about an inch and a half to two inches uh, of leek, you know, the, the end of the leek, mm -hmm. and I'll put it in water. So there's all these little bits of leek in water and then for about five days and then when the roots are starting to, to grow, mm -hmm. I'll put them in the compost and get more leeks. Um, I, oh, never I do that at the end of the, um, uh, if you buy celery, at the end. Um, yeah. again, two inches yeah. before the end and plant it. And romaine lettuce is another one that will... And it's expensive, so it's nice to get another romaine lettuce. <laughs> Absolutely, that's brilliant. They're really good tips. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that. Anybody else? Well, look, well, maybe I am, give her kind of, our time's nearly up, but I, um, I've only a couple of weeks things to go. So I'll crack on with that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to skip through to the end. Okay, so uh, yes, plants, plants for limited sun. So if you don't, you know, not everybody's got a lovely sunny backyard or gets sun even for two or three hours in the day. So there are, but there are lots of things you can grow. Somebody mentioned rhubarb there. So rhubarb doesn't actually need a sunny position at all. And um, things like mint, foxgloves, ivy, um, even primroses, because obviously they're used to growing under hedgerows. Um, don't need much sun wild garlic and this is the time of year for that if you're out for a walk in the park um loads of wild garlic about and sweet woodruff um which i have some growing out here probably not that common um but really good for for pollinating insects and stuff as well and then growing inside um i suppose growing, growing inside isn't just limited to houseplants although um rebecca seems to be the expert at that um, but house plants are lovely. I think just you know, being able to look at oh. some green is oh, um, can be a lovely oh. thing. Um, but you don't have to be just limited to your typical house plants. So lots of um, fruit and veg and flowers and stuff can be grown inside as well. And I'm thinking about things like um, um, chilies chilies and peppers and tomato plants, stuff that really needs quite a warm climate are really good to grow inside in your house. And then one of my favorite things to grow, um, and I, I have mentioned it a time or two through this presentation, are pea shoots. So within your kit, you would have got a wee packet of peas, um, which is a, a good starter pack for you. And um, pea shoots, the pea shoots in that photograph are like 10 days old. So really all you do is um, three quarter 
fill your container with compost, sprinkle your peas over the top and um, cover them with a layer of compost, again, to the depth of themselves. So, you know, not mad far down and um, water that in. And in a few days time, you'll see the bee um, shoots popping up again. And so those were 10 days old and probably in another couple of days, they were ready for picking. And if you pick them or cut them with a wee pair of scissors above um, their first leaf, they'll grow again for you two or three times. Um, and those pea shoots are great just to eat as they are. They're lovely in salads, sandwiches, pasta, um, whatever. And um, I think there's a wee graphic that shows that how you grow those speedy pea shoots. And I think that will be shared, that will definitely be shared with you in the top tips, which are going to follow um, probably, which Melly will be sending out to everybody. But yeah, give pea shoots a go. And the other brilliant thing about pea shoots is um, any packet of dried marifat peas. So you know the way you get, um, you get bigger peas. Um, or Buchanan's peas, just whatever you buy in the corner shop, they're about 65p a packet, loads of peas, and that would keep you going in pea shoots for, for quite a long time. So, so there you go, that's the end. I'm sorry, I have run over a wee bit, but um, I'm really happy to take some of your questions if you have any. In the break, Rebecca and I were talking about bug hotels. Um, where's the best place to put it? Yes, Christine, we're um we're we're going to cover that next week. Although, right, okay. Aoife, maybe do you want to hop in there and um share your wisdom? Yeah, so you're really looking for somewhere. Um, if you have any soil at all in the garden, you're really looking for somewhere um that has a wee bit of greenery. If you don't have that, <clears throat> don't be worrying. Somewhere um preferably a wee bit shady, a wee bit damp. Um, but different places attract different kinds of insects, you know, but um, like Jilly said, we'll be going into more detail on that next week, but yeah, um, you can't really go far wrong with them, which is a good thing because you get insects almost anywhere. Um, but for the way bulk hotels, yeah, if you can have somewhere shady and somewhere um, with a wee bit of greenery or, you know, leaf litter or something around it, then the more the merrier, but um, yeah. That's that answers your question. Yeah. As I said, yeah, so not, not in full sunlight because insects, you know, do, you know, they, a, they can they can overheat and dry out really quickly, but, you know, they like a bit of shade as well. But I think the, um, the bee hotel that you got was quite substantial and you, you might want to, I think it is kind of for solitary bees potentially. So you might, and you probably need to put it up off the ground a wee bit, but we'll get into more detail about that next week, if that's all right. Any other burning questions? I think Barbara has a wee question. Do you want to go ahead there, Barbara? Um, I've got, uh, I've bought some um, primrose, not primrose, uh, bluebell, um, uh, what do you call them? The wee oh. one? Yeah, bulbs, that's yeah. the word. Mm -hmm. um, I bought some bluebell bulbs and um, can I just plant, you know, can I do what I do with the wildflower seeds? Can I just throw them on or do I have to pl uh, plant them? Uh, Barbara, I would, um, yes, I would, you, you want to plant them down into the soil. Yeah. Um, I suppose a couple of reasons for that, but, but you know, one is um, it'll stop them getting eaten. Yeah. By things like squirrels and stuff but um but also you you know they're if they're kind of covered up um they're going to get a better chance of, of surviving of surviving absolutely and of course they'll they'll be dormant until um well if you actually if you have you just bought them now yeah 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 well actually if you plant them out anytime now or are you going to put them in a pot or out in the ground I was wanting to put them out in the ground because there's a big space of ground that's overrun with weeds sure. every year and it takes over. So I was going to try and, because I love, I absolutely love them and I've tried um, before to grow them, but I thought I'll get the bulbs this time and try 
you sure. know. Sure. Well, look, absolutely. But I, and I would get them in the ground now because, um, and if you're lucky, they'll you know they'll come up for you this year. So okay, thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Anybody else, or is that should I let you go now? I kind of you've been very good and very patient, and it's been lovely to see you all. I have to say, thank you. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody next week. So next week's session is on, it's kind of more about biodiversity and making your, your garden really friendly for insects and birds and, um, and hedgehogs and stuff like that. So uh, I'm sorry, what day is, is it on next week? Again, it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Or sorry, no, it's it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, not much Tuesday. Yeah, Friday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, like it was this week. Okay. Um. So I think you can. I think you've been sent the link, so you can choose. You know, if something doesn't switch, you can choose to join another one. Mm -hmm. But it'll be the same content for the three days next week as well. Yeah, well, I'll have to change it to Friday next week. Okay. Other training, so. Ah right. Okay, Alison. Well, th listen, thanks a million, everybody. Um, enjoy you. the rest of your day and, and get sowing those seeds and, and gathering up all those, that stuff for recycling and um, getting to use. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take Thank care. You. Bye. 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 Bye.